Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more of the Great War, and this time we are on to week 219, Germany's Reckoning and Bulgarian Armistice. Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below, I'd love to join the Discord and follow me over Twitch, and please do go check out the gaming channel here on YouTube. Um, there was someone else I wanted to say, and I'm just completely blanking on what I wanted to say. Oops. Oh, you hear any noise, other noise that is not me, just because I have my window open. It's fucking hot and humid, and I don't have my <coughs> AC unit put in yet in my window, so I'm suffering. Um, And also, hopefully my allergies aren't too bad today, but they might be. We'll see how it progresses. That out of the way... Let's go ahead and get into Germany's reckoning. The Allies had lost a major player in this war, Russia, and the Serbian lands had been overrun, but the four central powers had held fast. Until this week. For this week, Bulgaria leaves the war. Whoa, such a major power. How the f- Let's talk about Bulgaria, all right, for a hot second here. How the fuck can you guys hear that? Oh god, I'm gonna have to close it. Anyways, uh, how the fuck do you fight on one singular front for the entire? Well, I guess Romania. We're not gonna fucking count Romania. That wasn't much of a fight. The Germans pretty much cleared that shit out quick. Um, how the fuck do you pretty much only watch the Serbian Greek front? For pretty much the entire fucking length of your time in the war. And then the moment the Allies start meaningfully pushing, you just completely, utterly collapse. That's pathetic, dude. How do you have a worse performance than Austria-Hungary, Austria man? That's kind of sad. Like, the Serbs did better than you, and they're a tiny-ass country. Bulgaria, you should be ashamed. Oh my god. That's embarrassing, dude. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, the Allied routes on the Palestine and Macedonian fronts continued, while on the Western Front... Hell, Albania did better than you, Bulgaria. Montenegro did better. Kinda. They're just so small that they didn't really have... <laughs> they didn't really have much time anyway. Two new offensives, a British one and a Franco-American one, also began. And this week, two more Allied Western Front offensives began. In the north, on the 28th, began what some call the Fifth Battle of Ypres. This begins on a 40-kilometer front from Dixmude to Pruegstiert and features Army Group North, commanded by Belgian King Albert, with French General Jean de Goutte as his chief of staff, and with Jean Herbert Plumer's British Second Army under his command. The plan was to head east from Ypres, cross the salient, and take the Passchendaele Ridge. It was 10 British divisions, 6 French, and 9 Belgian. Plumer actually wanted to bypass the salient and head towards Messines, but British commander Sir Douglas Haig didn't want to press the issue since he really wanted to get the Belgians into action. Anyhow, Plumer did not do a preliminary barrage to try and maintain surprise, though he was only somewhat successful. The troops attacked over the same old terrain as last year, in the rain and with no tanks, but the German defense was not what it had been last year. On the 28th, the Allies advanced as far as 13 kilometers in places, overran the salient, and took most of the ridge. The Belgians took Passchendaele itself. By the end nice. of the 29th, Messines and Gelluvelt were also occupied, and they had... Well, that went a whole lot better than the last time they fought in Polygon Wood and Passchendaele. <laughs> ...reached the Wuller's Menin Road. By then, though, with the rain and the mud again turning the land into a swamp, it was nearly impossible to bring up supplies, and the offensive was halted for the time being on the second. That was the third of four offensives that had all begun within a few days of each other. Three of those four lost momentum, but not the fourth, the attack on saint Quentin Canal by the British Fourth Army. This was against a formidable German defense, the center of the Hindenburg Line. The canal was... Ooh. The center's calm bloom like that. The Germans are done for. 11 meters Yikes. wide with water and mud two to three meters deep. But it was also filled with barbed wire. 
and the perpendicular banks had walls three meters high, so tanks could not cross it. Concrete machine gun posts on the east bank protected it, as well as continuous trenches, and it was the center of the great defense in depth system. However, the Canadians had captured defense plans back on August 8th, which yeah, showed artillery, Ooh. supply dumps, dugouts, everything. And though the defense system was strong, it was relatively old, and a lot of it was outdated or deteriorating. But even with an enormous three-day artillery barrage beforehand, the attack on the 29th did not initially go that well. And the attackers did not even have a great numerical superiority. It was two Australian and two American divisions, and a lot of... Baby, that's all you need. The Aussies and the Americans? The Yanks? <laughs> Dude, unstoppable duo? <laughs> Come on. Who's gonna be swearing all the time? Tanks, which attacked across two tunnels in the canal. Well, it depends on what kind of American. Not all Americans swear equally, all right? Uh, I think, who swears the most out of the Americans? I feel like it's us Midwesterners. Like, the most casually are, I feel like Midwest is the most casual about it. New York, the most passionate about it, right? They're like, you feel the fuck you from a New Yorker. But a Midwesterner is, like, is just like, ah, fuck. You know, ah, it is what it is. The South, I don't think, swears that much. Well, they have their own, like, words that are different. Now, Anyways. on the left, they did not make it to the Hindenburg line. The center made a bit more progress. No, I wouldn't fucking try. I wouldn't be. What the? What if that thing tips? You don't get crushed. What the? F huh? Like the center of gravity? Of this tank? Looks like it's like around there. Like it wouldn't, it could just go whoop. However, British General Henry Rawlinson had insisted over General John Monash's objections on a crossing of the actual canal itself by the North Midland 46th Division on the right flank. Their barrage took care of the barbed wire and broke the canal banks. And by 8.30 a.m., they had crossed the canal and taken an intact bridge. They took the main enemy positions and continued until the 32nd Division could leapfrog them late in the day. This was a major, major feat. John Terrains calls it one of the outstanding feats of arms of the war. The Hindenburg Line had been broken in a stretch well over a dozen kilometers. The British would widen the gap... At I wonder why, why they didn't do the leapfrogging technique before. Because it's largely similar to what they would have learned at least if uh, these generals would have learned studying uh, Napoleonic tactics, uh, musket uh, fighting tactics, where it's one line shoots, they drop, and line behind them shoots, they drop, and next line behind them, if they're three rows deep, the third line drops, and then by the time the third line fires, the first line's ready to go again, and they fire, and then they drop, second line's already ready to go, and they fire. Right? Like, it's essentially the same tactic, just much different scale, you know, uh, on a much grander tactical level. Why wasn't, I guess, oh, uh, like, and I mean, obviously it's kind of hard to, I guess, understand that because like in this day and age, you're kind of, kind of assume that all the tactics and strategies have already been developed. Um, but then someone, someone out there still could pro in this modern day could probably come up with a, a a new strategy or battlefield tactic, and then everyone will be sitting around wondering why didn't y'all do that before, you know? But like I don't know, this this one just seems like I mean all of them kind of seem like they should have been done before. Like I can understand the the as I said before the coordinated assaults uh, incorporating air. Uh, artillery and troops and tanks into a into a single assault. I can because that was just technology they did not have before. I can understand that, but the leapfrogging one feels like something they should have done before. As the week went on, and only the Beau Rivoire line, the third and final line of the whole system, remained in enemy hands. David Stevenson writes that British intelligence reported October first that the German divisions recently engaged were twelve in Flanders. 23 in Champagne and the Argonne, and 32 opposite Cambrai. It was in that center 
where the largest attacks were coming. On the 30th, the Germans torched Cambrai. <laughs> French oh, General Charlemagne advanced on the vessel and the Ain. The next day, the Germans fell back from the Rem Ain Plateau. The day after that, they withdrew north and south of La Bassie Canal, and the British took Armentieres. Mangin had reached the Islet, and at the end of the week, far to the north, the German big guns were being removed from the Flanders coast. But the German army was not nearly defeated, and by the 29th, the Americans had been stopped in the Argonne, partly by the Germans, who had brought in six divisions of reinforcements in a couple of days, and partly by total chaos in their own supply and communication lines. They had reached the Klimhilde Stellung, the strongest German defensive line there, but had not yet taken it, and congestion was so bad that when French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau went to recently captured Montfaucon, his path was blocked by American trucks, whose drivers told him they'd been stuck in traffic for two solid days. No. At the end of the week, after reorganizing their supply lines, the Americans attacked Krimhilde Stellung IV. They had a big numerical advantage, but this is a hard place to attack, and they did not reach their targets. The Germans very well knew how strategically important this area was. A World Undone says that OHL, German High Command, considered it the corner pillar of the Western Front. And since it had been reinforced, it would be a tough nut to crack, though they were trying in the face of devastating machine gun fire. And a small advance American force in the Argonne was cut off and surrounded, but more on them next week. Anyhow, one nut the Allies had completely broken open was the Macedonian Front. After being routed the past two weeks, a second Bulgarian request for an armistice is accepted by desperate Frankie, General Franche Despere, commander of the Allied Army of the Orient. It is signed the 29th, and Bulgaria's war is over. They surrender at noon on the 30th and accept Allied terms. Immediate suspension of hostilities, immediate demobilization, handing over of stores and equipment, immediate evacuation of Serbian and Greek territory, all Bulgarian transport placed at Allied disposal. The departure of all Austro-German forces from Bulgaria within four weeks. So the German route to the east was now cut, and the German uh -oh. Middle East dream was now dead. The Radomir Rebellion that began last week in Bulgaria is defeated after three days of fighting just south of Sofia. Uh, Outside the borders, launch. the Macedonian capital Skopje fell to the French. The Germans there were in retreat, since there was now no hope of holding the Balkans, and the southern approach to Austria lay open. The rail hub of Uskub fell the morning of the 29th. The Austro-Hungarians on the front take defensive measures, but the Italians push forward in Albania, and the French and Serbs drive them back in the Vranja region. By the week's end, Tsar Ferdinand of Bulgaria has abdicated and has been succeeded by his son Boris. Interestingly Boris. enough, Alexander Stamboliski, who led the Radomir Rebellion, will be Boris's prime minister next year. What? But the Macedonian front was not the okay. only central powers front that had been collapsing. In Palestine on the 28th, the British cross the upper Jordan River and meet up with the forces of the Arab revolt near Dara. On the 30th, British General Edmund Allenby's cavalry, after riding over 600 kilometers in 12 days, had arrived at Damascus. The 3rd Light Horse Brigade from Western Australia entered the city and the Turks finally stopped firing their weapons. Hundreds of years of Ottoman rule there was at an end. A few hours later, Lawrence of Arabia arrived in a Rolls Royce escorted by Indian cavalry. The Arab revolt had succeeded. Woo! But what did German high command think of these developments? Well, on the evening of September 28th, German Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff had told Chief of Staff Paul von Hindenburg that they had to seek an armistice. The next day, with Bulgaria out of the war, they went to the Kaiser and said that the war could not continue. One big problem, though, is that American President Woodrow Wilson will not negotiate with the Kaiser or the German military. Grasping not only the nettle of military defeat, but also that of political democratization, the Kaiser signed a proclamation establishing a parliamentary regime. Oh, that's In the good. space of a single day, Germany's militarism and autocracy were all but over. Well, Martin Gilbert says that. But G.J. Meyer fleshes it out a bit more in A World Undone. See, German Foreign Minister Paul von Hinze had suggested a revolution from above 
a change of the German political system to show that Germany would have democratic leadership and it would be done by, not in spite of, the Kaiser, right? What it involved was giving representatives from the Reichstag cabinet posts. Okay, this might not sound so radical, but to the German conservatives, it was an enormous violation of tradition. Chancellor Georg von Hertling even resigned rather than accept this, but Kaiser Wilhelm signed it. His signature was the strongest imaginable evidence of how desperate the German leaders now understood their situation to be. It was also, sadly, a way of maneuvering the liberals and socialists in the Reichstag <laughs> into taking a share of the blame for the disaster that was unfolding. Also, Ludendorff was pretty worried that his army was infected by socialist ideas, and there was indeed great political agitation. Oh my god, the military developing socialist ideas in a socialistic system? What the fuck do you think the army is? The army is socialist. Like, Sorry, y'all, it is. Especially in the modern day. The benefits that, like, the living situation for, like, when soldiers are in the army, that's socialist, dude. That's socialist as fuck. <laughs> Especially modern day. Uh, and then the benefits that they receive in our modern day. Now, of course, is it, is it, is it very uh, poorly managed and not at all funded well? Yes. Oh, but it's still, the benefits themselves are still socialist in nature. So. Like, I, I don't know how people can be so surprised that, that soldiers go left. Invitation <laughs> at home in Germany, especially by the Spartacists who demanded an end of the monarchy and a socialist republic. But the first German revolution did in fact take place on October 2nd, though not oh. in the streets and not as a socialist revolution. Oh. It was in the council chamber and Prince Max von Baden, second cousin to the Kaiser, became the new chancellor. He had two conditions for this. In future, only the Reichstag could declare war or peace and any control the Kaiser still had over the army or the navy must be ceded at once. Thing is, the choice of Max as chancellor kind of had the Allies thinking it was more of the same, since he was of a noble house and he was a relative of the Kaiser's. Hindenburg and Ludendorff now went to Max and told him what they'd told the Kaiser, that they needed an immediate truce. But Max disagreed. See, he thought that even with the military setbacks, the army could hold out for many months still, and he didn't want to start negotiations with his position already basically surrendered. Hindenburg said, you are very much mistaken. And hmm. Max said, okay, if things are so bad, just raise the white flag in the field. Max thought that too quick an armistice would result in the loss of Alsace-Lorraine and the Polish parts of East Prussia under Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Hindenburg said that while losing Alsace-Lorraine was okay, losing any territory in the East was verboten. You may think from that, that the Chancellor had actually read the 14 points and Hindenburg had not, I don't actually know, but you may be right. So, at the end of the week, and with Austrian support, Max telegraphed Washington requesting an armistice. And what a week it was, with Damascus falling, Bulga Weird that he would send it to Washington. Why, why? I mean, I guess the Amer- but the the Amer like surely the Germans are aware that the Americans don't really have the pull to tell the British and French to stop fighting. Um, but obviously, like I think I understand his logic behind sending it to the Americans because I think he probably I don't think uh, the British or French would agree to it. Um, that that could be why but still Bulgaria leaving the war and four allied offensives in progress on the western front one of them breaking the mighty Hindenburg line Ludendorff famously said on the 30th we cannot fight against the whole world also he had written a letter to Berlin stating that the collapse of the Macedonian front and the impossibility of making up the enormous losses in the west made an immediate armistice necessary Hindenburg had signed it too Ludendorff ended the letter with this. Every day lost cost thousands of brave soldiers' lives. 
That sentence could have been written about any of the past 1,527 days of this war. If you'd like to learn more about Bulgaria before the yeah. war, you can click here for our Bulgaria. And that was Germany's reckoning, Bulgarian armistice, the Great War Week 219. This was a really good week. Um, this was like it was. This was one of those really engaging weeks. Although I didn't still, I didn't talk that much. It was still one of those like the information itself is engaging and just great to listen to. It isn't just the soldiers are advancing. There's other things happening that is fun to hear. Um, but yeah, uh, the, damn. Not many more weeks left, y'all. Not many more Great War videos left. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.